An eagle can make precision moves. It's a little like forklifts and their operators. Forklifts give one person the power to move large loads with apparently effortless precision. But not understanding them can be dangerous. Every year, incorrect forklift operation results in more than 100 deaths and upwards of 38,000 injuries. Before you're allowed to operate a forklift, you'll be trained and certified by your employer. That means you'll learn forklift basics, as well as how to operate the type of forklift you'll be using. You'll also learn how to be sure your forklift is in good working order. That involves two mandatory inspections of the power plant and equipment before every shift. They only take a few minutes, but they're required and should never be skipped. If your employer provides a checklist, fill it out and turn it in every time. It's proof you're following safety requirements and makes the inspection easy. Let's start with the power plant. Forklifts are powered by batteries or by gasoline, diesel or propane. First, check the fuel system for damage, rust, leaks, secure connections and other potential problems. Always follow the inspection procedure specified by the forklift manufacturer. Whether your forklift is powered by battery or fuel, never smoke or allow smoking around it. And keep it away from flames and hot work. The second part of your pre-use inspection requires checking for damage and proper operation at the beginning of each shift. Check each part of the forklift, including mast, hydraulic system, lift tilt cylinders, and forks for broken or cracked welds, dents, or other damage. Make sure all moving parts are well lubricated and the chains are free to travel. Then test all systems with the forklift turned on. Make sure controls, gauges, indicators and warning lights are all in good working order. Put the forklift through normal maneuvers, including raising and lowering the mast to test moving parts. Pay particular attention to brakes, steering and warning devices such as lights and horns. Do not operate the forklift unless everything is working properly. Once the inspections are complete, you're ready to begin work. Remember that every load and every situation is different, and that knowledge, skill, and judgment are required for safe forklift operation. The shape and size of the load, as well as its position on the forks, affect stability. All loads must be within the forklift's capacity, and carried all the way back on the forks. The forklift is a delicate balancing act. With a fulcrum and center of gravity, you must understand and respect every time you approach a load. A forklift is less stable when its load is above the ground, when it's turning, or when it's operating on uneven or sloped surfaces. Tip-overs, dropped loads, and poor steering result when operators don't consider stability and capacity. Consider your destination and how to get there. Are there any hazards or obstacles along the way? Will you have room to maneuver to safely deliver the load? You'll be required to know your forklift inside and out. Read the operator's manual to understand forklift load capacity and how an oddly shaped load or attachment may affect your forklift. A forklift can give you the precision of an eagle, but you have to be alert and know how to operate it safely. An eagle can react to danger quickly. If there's an emergency at work, you need to recognize it and know what to do. It's spelled out in your facility's Emergency Action Plan, or EAP. Become familiar with the correct response procedure because you're a key part of it. You're an extension of your employer's eyes and ears. Be alert to potential problems before they turn into crises. After all, who knows better than you what's normal in your own work area? Always remember, not every emergency begins with smoke, sparks, or fumes. Keep an eye out for strangers and observe differences in your work area. Doors or windows left open when they're usually locked. Unidentified boxes or packages in odd places. Mail that's dirty, oily, misshapen, or smells strange. All of these could be harmless, or they might be deadly. Be eagle alert and be safe. If something doesn't seem right, report it to the designated person who can evaluate the situation and take appropriate action. That might be an emergency team leader in your work area or your employer's emergency response coordinator. Of course, you may not have time to do that. Emergencies can spring up very quickly and you may have to react in a split second.
make sure you recognize your facility's alarm or warning system and that you know how to activate it. If you hear the alarm, don't hesitate. Don't stop to wonder if it's a drill. Immediately begin following the emergency action plan. You may be assigned special duties under the plan, shutting down equipment, for instance. Carry them out only if your personal safety is not in immediate danger. Communication systems are often the first to fail in an emergency situation. That's why a central incident command post is a crucial part of crisis management. It is the designated contact for all emergency information and communications. The incident command post collects and disseminates critical information about the company, its employees, and the status of the emergency. If, for instance, you saw something suspicious or know a co-worker is trapped in the building, that's the place to report it. The central command post also coordinates the efforts of local response crews, fire, police, and rescue personnel. A final word about emergency communications. A cell phone can be a vital, life-saving link to the outside when other systems fail. If you have one, be ready to share it. And remember, the best emergency action plan can't protect you if you don't know it and follow it. If you work with chemicals, you too need the Eagle's alertness to watch for hazards. That means being aware of what you're working with, how to safely handle chemicals, and what to do when there's a problem. Chemicals can come in solid, liquid, or gas form, and their hazards vary. Each container must have two labels, one identifying the contents and the other to describe the nature of the hazard. Before handling any chemical, it's better to check with the Material Safety Data Sheet, or MSDS. That's the best source of information on hazards, safe handling, use, and storage. If the MSDS or your facility rules calls for personal protective equipment, wear exactly what is called for. Don't substitute since many injuries result from wearing the wrong personal protective equipment, PPE, or using it incorrectly. Make sure it's undamaged and fits correctly. Use the proper containers when transferring chemicals and be certain they're sturdy and leak-proof. Always be sure to label the new container properly. When storing chemicals, stack containers carefully, but not too high so they won't fall. Don't put them where they can block aisles or doors. Treat cylinders containing compressed gases as potentially explosive. Never expose them to high temperatures. When the cylinder is empty, promptly remove the regulator and replace it with a protective cap and mark it as empty. Secure cylinders with straps or chains for moving or storage, or place them in an appropriate stand to prevent them from falling. Flammable materials require special precautions. Keep them away from all ignition sources, sparks, and hot work, and always observe no smoking regulations where they're used or stored. Use static bonding and grounding procedures when transferring flammables. Glass bottles containing combustible liquids should be carried in rubber cradles to minimize breakage risks. Use fireproof cabinets approved by the National Fire Protection Association, or NFPA, to store flammable substances away from the work area. And never store oxidizers and flammables in the same area. In case of fire, they're an explosive combination. In the event of a spill or leak, strict guidelines must be followed immediately. Either the Hazardous Waste Operations and Emergency Response, or HAZWOPER standard, or Title III of the Superfund Amendment Reauthorization Act, SARA for short, may apply. HAZWOPER establishes strict training level guidelines for dealing with dangerous spills or leaks. It prohibits workers from hazardous waste operations or emergency response activities unless they are properly trained. In other words, do only what you're trained to do in an emergency and stay out of everyone else's way. In addition, SARA's Title III mandates that any hazardous spill of more than a threshold limit must be reported immediately, either to local or other designated authorities. Handling chemicals requires your constant awareness, so make like an eagle, pay attention, and stay safe. Like an eagle on the attack, electricity can strike quickly and be deadly. We forget how dangerous it can be because electricity makes so much possible in our lives that we take it for granted. In fact, electrocution is the second leading cause of death among general industry workers. 
But if the eagle illustrates the danger of electricity, he also demonstrates the best way to protect yourself. Constant vigilance and care when working around it. Your employer provides engineering controls to minimize shock hazards. Insulation is one. It's material that acts as a barrier between you and flowing current. Rubber, glass, mica, and some plastics are examples. Intact insulation protects. Unfortunately, age, weather, or hard use break it down with deadly consequences. So never rely on insulation to protect you fully. Remember, it may have pinholes in it you can't see. Respect it and use safe work practices. Safe work practices provide another type of insulation. At the beginning of each shift, inspect your work area and tools for electrical hazards. Are your power tools in good condition and good working order? That means grips and casings are intact, not cracked or worn. Cords and terminals aren't cut or frayed. And all safety guards and shields are in place. Equally important, use tools correctly. If you plug into an extension cord, for instance, is it rated for the tool and environment? If not, you might be in for quite a shock. Extension cords should have a three-wire cord and a ground fault circuit interrupter. As the name indicates, a GFCI interrupts the current when there are potentially dangerous variations between hot and neutral wires in the cord. GFCIs can be special receptacles, circuit breaker or portable types, or can be built into the extension cord. Check extension cords for loose parts, deformed or missing pins, and damage to its outer jacket or insulation. Be sure plug and receptacle are compatible. Safe outlets are grounded and should never be overloaded. That means never create an octopus of too many power cords plugged into one wall socket. Become familiar with safety signs, symbols, and barriers, as well as color coding. Stop bars and emergency cutoff switches are usually red. Orange is sometimes used to mark dangerous exposed machine parts or electrical hazards, while yellow calls for caution. Green indicates safety items, such as the location of first aid kits. Housekeeping is another important work safety practice. Keep tools and equipment clean. A little oily film or carbon deposit can conduct electrical current. Water and electricity are a deadly combination. Never work with electricity in the rain or if there's moisture in your work area. Cleanup spills immediately. Wet floors are particularly dangerous around power tools and equipment. Even wet clothes or your own sweat can pose a hazard. Remember, moisture increases conductivity, and that can provide current a better path to your heart. What does that mean? Serious injury or even death by electrocution. Don't risk it. Sometimes, our jobs require us to use our bodies in ways they weren't intended. That's where ergonomics comes in. Ergonomics helps people adapt tasks to their bodies instead of forcing them to fit their bodies to their work. That prevents musculoskeletal disorders, or MSDs, problems that result from stressing your body beyond its ability to adjust and recover. The stress may involve muscles, nerves, tendons, ligaments, joints, cartilage, or spinal discs. It can be aggravated by a very simple task. In fact, you may wonder why it causes you problems, but doesn't seem to bother the person next to you. The reason is that it takes a particular combination of factors to cause a problem. Your body size and type, the design of your work area, the task and the number of times it's repeated all come into play. Consider the six common causes of MSDs. Lifting, repetitive motion, contact stress, extreme force, vibration, and awkward posture. Many jobs involve more than one of these, and today, more companies are conducting ergonomic reviews to eliminate them. You have a role in the process, too. Learn to recognize the signs and symptoms of MSDs. When recognized and reported early, action can be taken to stop problems in their tracks. Often, it just takes simple adjustments in the way you work. Muscle fatigue or pain that disappears with rest could be a symptom. So could aching burning, numbness, stiffness, or tingling. If you continue to perform the task that causes them, the symptoms generally become more severe. Other signs include a decreased range of motion, some part of your body won't move as far as it used to, or decreased grip strength, 
not being able to hold on to things as well as you once could. Still more signs include loss of function, deformity, swelling, cramping, redness, or loss of color. If you suspect a work-related musculoskeletal disorder, report it immediately. Be ready to describe the signs or symptoms you're having, their impact on your job performance, and what part of your body is affected. Your employer will also want to know what you believe is causing the symptoms. Your prompt action can help you get proper evaluation to prevent the problem from becoming worse. Remember that workplaces and employees are different, so applying ergonomics is like solving a puzzle. Your input is a critical piece of that. Ultimately, the final solution may involve new equipment, changes in your work area layout or position, or even varying the tasks you perform and the way you move. Adjustable tables and chairs are among the most common ergonomic equipment found in today's workplace. Employees can raise or lower them to suit their own bodies. In most cases, people are most efficient and comfortable working at waist level. U-shaped tables, rolling shelves, and turntables are designed to minimize stressful reaching. Some jobs provide particular stresses, such as the lifting and repetition of materials handling. The good news is that there is specialized ergonomic equipment for those types of jobs, too. Depending on your assignment, you may use adjustable conveyors, mobile lift carts, or suspension devices to balance and support tools. Even floor cushioning or padded tool handles can minimize stressful vibration. But sometimes, the solution is just changing the way you work. Every muscle and part of your body has a next position, where you move when you change position. Just shifting your body occasionally reduces stress and is one of the best ways to prevent musculoskeletal disorders. For instance, put your hands on a firm surface and let your body drop forward. If you're standing still, bend your knees as if you're walking. Or even try walking in place for a minute or two. And be sure to take breaks occasionally. Remember, when it comes to musculoskeletal disorders, you're the ultimate prevention expert. Eagle alertness can prevent crushed limbs, severed hands, and lots of other serious injuries on the job. That's why you see safeguarding barriers to prevent entry into a point of operation, nip point, or other danger area. Left in place, machine guards can save you from whirling metal parts, powerful compression systems, and razor-sharp blades. Generally, any machine part, function, or process that may cause injury must be safeguarded. There are three places injury is most likely to occur. The point of operation, where work such as cutting, grinding, shaping, or boring is performed. The power transmission apparatus, the area of the machinery that transmits energy to the part doing the work. It may involve pulleys, belts, flywheels, connecting rods, chains, or cranks. And other moving parts, whether rotating or in transverse motion. Feed mechanisms are also possible hazard spots. But machine safeguards can protect you and co-workers from all these hazards, if you'll let them. A guard should be designed and constructed so that it can't be tampered with or easily removed. Of course, you'll be less tempted to do either if the guard doesn't interfere with a machine's smooth operation. But should you find one that slows work or makes operation uncomfortable, report it to your supervisor. Never alter a guard yourself. Besides protecting you, a machine guard should also keep other objects from getting into the works. A machine guard can prevent a hand tool from falling into running machinery and shooting out as a dangerous projectile. One more thing about machine guards, they shouldn't create new hazards. They shouldn't have jagged edges or force you to reach over and around them to activate the machinery. Guards are barriers which prevent access to danger areas. There are four types. A fixed guard is a permanent part of the machine that doesn't rely on any other part to function. An interlocked guard connects to a tripping mechanism that shuts off the power automatically if it's lifted or removed. Restarting the machine should require you to perform a manual reset. An adjustable guard allows flexibility to accommodate various sizes of stock. These guards should always be adjusted before starting machinery, and operation requires extreme caution. Devices are systems that involve several parts working together to protect the operator. The parts comprising a device may or may not move. There are several types of devices. Safety trip controls provide a means to immediately stop machinery in an emergency.
pressure or breaking an electronic plane, usually at the point of operation, stops the machine. Placement of the trip controls is critical. A bar or electronic beam should be placed at eye, chest, or waist level. A manual reset is required to restart the machine afterwards. A two-hand control is a device that requires constant simultaneous pressure to activate the machinery. It keeps both hands out of the danger zone while the machine is running. A two-hand trip also requires both the operator's hands to apply simultaneous pressure on controls to start the machine cycle. But once it's active, pressure can be removed. Consequently, the trips are far enough from the point of operation to prevent your hands from slipping into it. A gate is a safeguard that combines aspects of device and guard for increased protection. Unless it's properly in place, the machinery will not start or run. When the machine is running, the gate acts as a barrier to the point of operation. Raise the gate, the machine stops. Having safeguards doesn't eliminate the need for eagle awareness. Always be sure people and objects are clear of machine operations. And of course, never wear jewelry or loose clothing that could get snagged by moving parts. Eagle-eyed awareness is always important on the job, but distractions when you work on or around machinery can result in devastating injury or worse, and it can happen in the blink of an eye. Vigilance works to keep eagles safe. Let it work for you, too. Transporting hazardous materials, hazmat, is a job with heavy responsibilities. To do it safely, you must comply with laws that specify everything from labeling to storage to loading and transportation. You must even know what to do if there's an accident. In fact, if you're a hazmat vehicle operator, you'll be required to get a special endorsement for your commercial driver's license, CDL. Every employee who prepares hazmat for transportation receives specific training to do the job according to Department of Transportation regulations. According to DOT, hazardous material, hazmat for short, is a substance that poses an unreasonable risk to health, safety, property, and the environment when transported in commerce. The hazardous materials table defines nine hazmat classes, and each is categorized into subclasses or divisions. For instance, class 1 refers to explosives. Class 1.1 specifically includes the most hazardous materials, such as black powder, dynamite, detonating fuses, and TNT. Other less volatile explosives fall into divisions 2 through 6. Each class carries specific regulations, such as which materials can never be stored or transported together. Transporting hazmat requires complete, detailed shipping papers. They may be called bills of lading, shipping orders, manifests, or invoices. But they are harmonized with international standards. Before you're asked to fill out a shipping paper, you'll be thoroughly trained. Even packaging is regulated when you're transporting hazmat. Before you're asked to package hazmat, you'll receive specific training in this part of the regulation. All markings must be in English on a sharply contrasting background. They must be durable, unobscured, and separated from other markings. Hazardous materials warning labels are also required. They are diamond-shaped and 3.9 inches on each side. The only exception is cargo aircraft-only labels, which are rectangular. In addition, placards are placed on trucks, freight containers, and rail cars transporting hazmat. The placards must be securely fastened, prominently displayed, and visible from the front of the vehicle. Loading rules are stipulated in the hazardous materials regulation, which may also include storage requirements. For example, poisons can never be carried in the same truck as foodstuffs, unless special liquid-tight, dust-proof containers are used. There is a segregation table for hazardous materials that governs each mode of transport – trucks, boats, planes, and trains. It spells out what can and cannot be shipped or stored together. Your company's standard operating procedures should thoroughly cover this part of the hazardous materials regulations. Become very familiar with facility safety rules and always follow them. You'll be trained to know what to do in an emergency how to assess the site and evaluate the situation, find the location of the leak or spill, identify the contents of the drum or package. Unless you are certified in Hazardous Waste Operations and Emergency Response, or HAZWOPER, your responsibility with any spill or leak ends with a call for help 
and keeping traffic and spectators clear. Cleanup efforts will be determined by the type of hazmat, but proper packaging, marking, labeling, and shipping papers will always be required. Transporting hazardous materials is a serious responsibility. Know the regulations and follow them. Not only are they required by law, but they will help protect you from the dangers of hazmat.